Hey everyone, Matt here with Duke's Models, and welcome to the final installment of the Kitty Hawk SU-17 build review. Now, we've gone through the whole slog of turning a bunch of sprues into this, and it's time to get to closing thoughts. Now typically the way these closing thoughts work on a lot of reviews is, you know, tour of the pros and cons, a bit of a dog, shut up compressor, a bit of a dog and pony show, finally getting to the final take, which in many reviews is Highly recommended. Um, yeah, we're not going to do that this time out. Instead, I'm going to get to my final take right away, just straight out of the gate. Then we'll move into the pros and cons. So what's my final take? Um, honestly, it's an anti-recommendation. Don't buy this kit. Please, don't reward Kitty Hawk for this ongoing just lack of fucks given about engineering quality. They've been doing this for years, and every kit that comes out is another inspired subject choice gets everyone's hopes up, comes out, and then it turns out, wait, it's a dog. It's a pain in the ass to build. It's got slipshot engineering. It's got just lazy, easily corrected mistakes. And the SU-17 is no exception. And honestly, I doubt that the forthcoming SU-34 and SU-35 are going to be in any, any exception to that either. The only way to get them to change is to have this insistence on quality become part of their business model. And the only way that's going to happen is if the shitty kits stop selling. So please don't buy this kit. You know, and this one, it's actually easier than most kitty or than most kitty hot kits because most other kitty hot kits, it's like, it's the only thing out there. If you want a one thirty second OV 10 Bronco, that's your choice. If you want a one thirty second Kingfisher, that's your choice. If you want a Gripen, that's pretty much your choice. With the SU-17, there's not only the old Copro kit out there, which is, you know, by all accounts, a torture in and of itself. There's a Hobby Boss kit coming out. There are rumors of another kit from another manufacturer that is in the development phase. There are rumors of a 132nd scale SU-17 that could be potentially pretty damn awesome. So, unless you just absolutely have to build an SU-17 right now, if nothing else, wait and see what these other ones bring to the table. You know, they're probably going to fit better. They may have some slight accuracy issues, but this thing does too. So that's my uh, my final word is don't buy it. Just don't. Um, this is a garbage fire of a kit, and it shouldn't be rewarded with money. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, let's talk about the pros and cons because... While I'm not a fan of this kit at all, it does have some pros, and it has a lot of cons. So on the on the pros side of things, the surface detail on this kit is quite good. Uh, it's definitely not, you know, a Wingnut Wings or a Tamiya or an AMK, but I would definitely put it up there with, you know, the higher end of what, say, Academy or Kinetic is doing these days, which is pretty damn good. The cockpit detail in particular especially on the side walls, you know, as you can see in here in the side consoles is up there with some of the best I've seen in 140A scale. And honestly, it's a thing that, you know, maybe to me, I should buy this kit just to look at the side wall detail because they kind of missed that mark on their F14 a little bit. Another pro is undoubtedly the design of the wings. These wings are fantastic. And if the rest of the kit were as good as the wings, we'd have a great SU-17 on our hands. I mean, these things fit together wonderfully. Um, everywhere that I was nervous about fit, about the way things would go together, based on what I had experienced in the build to that point, wasn't an issue. These things were fantastic. And I mean, even to this point, like I still have not glued these wings into the fuselage. They fit that well. And you know, the, the sweet motion still works just fine. Um, you know, aside from the ailerons, which have a weird sort of butt join, no, you know, no join uh, provisions given, everything else fits wonderfully. And these, even then, you know, they're pretty much drop fit. You just need to be careful with how you glue them in. Okay, so those are the pros. The surface detail, the cockpit detail, and the wings. Now let's talk about the cons. Okay, there are a lot of cons in this kit, so I'm going to try to go through them pretty quickly so you're not watching this for an hour. 
So on the underside, we've got the landing gear, which is a mess. The entire fork design on the nose gear is a pain in the ass, does not fit well, and basically will screw you if you're trying to do some sort of uh, you know, plug and play at the end when this thing is already painted and weathered. So if you buy this kit, which please don't, but if you buy it, um, be sure to pay special attention up here and get ready to deploy some creative countermeasures to overcome the kit's deficiencies. The main landing gear is similarly anti-plug-and-play, um, drop-in at the end of build friendly. There are a lot of little parts with very poor location, uh, poor location aid that will not stand up to, you know, or that will just completely overcome PVA glue. So you're gonna have to use something like Timmy Extra Thin or super glue or something of that nature, which doesn't usually react well to paint. So again, extensive planning is gonna be required to figure out how to paint detail and install the landing gear towards the end of a build. Another frustration with the main landing gear is the mounts into the wings are extremely shallow and the gear themselves aren't particularly strong. So what that leads to is, let me hold this a little better. What that leads to is some of the wobbliest landing gear I have encountered on a modern kit. And this stuff wags all over the place. Um, something to think about if you're maybe transporting one of these to a contest and having to set it down in a car while the car is moving. Um, this thing may not be on its wheels when you get there. Okay, the next con, the pylons, for a couple different reasons. Um, some of these internal pylons here that mount to the wings, as you can see, they sort of curve up to meet the wing surface. Well, inside there where they meet the wing surface, there are more than just mold seams, there are legitimate steps, like straight up plateaus and differences in height between one half and the other that sh just, in 2017, they shouldn't be there. Um, cleaning, them up, cleaning them up, especially along that curving surface, not fun. And at this point in the build with all the compounding, stupid sloppy mistakes that have happened, they very quickly approach a fuck it moment. As you can see, if you look closely in here at you know the pile, this pylon and this pylon as well, right along the mid section of it here on both of them, sink marks. The outer one isn't too bad because it's kind of away from detail, but this, this inner one, this is running right along a panel line, right along a bunch of rivet detail. Uh, that's gonna be a lot of fun to clean up. So, you know, this isn't completely sloppy engineering. It's sloppy engineering and additional things like sink marks that you're gonna have to go and fix up from a cosmetic standpoint. Another frustrating thing about the pylons, these outer pylons that sink up to the wing fences, they don't conform to the shape of the wing. And so what happens with that is you get a situation where say you have, you know, this is your wing, right? And this is the pylon and it sits, but it doesn't quite, doesn't quite clear this bulge that is the pivot point for the swing wings. So, you know, if you lay it down so that the back lines up flat with the wing, the front sticks out. But then if you push the front down, the back pops up. Now, it is possible with enough force and enough adhesive to, you know, essentially force it into place like this. But then you've got a thing where you've got a curve in the bottom of the pylon. And all of these pylons have various sub pylons and things like that that attach to them. And the sub pylons are all dead straight. So if you have, you know, a curving pylon like this and you put this on top of it, you are going to see that difference. It's going to be extremely visible. So, pylons suck. The next con is the intake. Now, there are three main things going on inside this intake that are problematic. So the first of them is the visible location tabs um, on the underside, you know, so if you're looking at this thing from a lot of very common angles that you would, you know, shoot pictures from or view it from, you can see the location tabs right up in there, right under the shot cone. Yes, you can remove them, but Honestly, it's 2017, you shouldn't have to remove them. Second is the way that it installs into the fuselage. 
where you have these tabs on either side that hook into circle type things in the fuselage themselves. First of all, this is completely fictitious. Second of all, the way that it seats in allows the shot cone to flop up and down, which shot cones don't do. So <clears throat> I don't know why this was chosen. It seems really lazy. And it ties into the third thing going on at the intake, which is the complete lack of an intake splitter. It's a very prominent feature up in the nose of an SU-17, and it's just not here at all. And I honestly don't know why, because it would have fixed the other two problems. It would have hidden that location tab, and it would have given the you know given something for the shot cone to locate to. It would have even given honestly a way for you to literally drop that shot cone in after the rest of the build was done, which would be really nice, wouldn't it? But they didn't do it. Next con, there are all these location tabs and slots that happen all over the airframe. So the wing fences have them, the dorsal spine has them. They seem nice, but then when you go and actually install the pieces, you can see the visible um, slots where the tabs go in after things are installed. You know, it's a little thing, but come on. Um, that's unnecessary cleanup. There are more elegant ways of doing this. Similar to the tabs and slots is the uh, use of these weird location tongue groove things on the lower sides of the fuselage. You know, typical location pins and holes are great because you have a hole and you have a pin and it sits in there and holds it. And, you know, well, some kits in some areas have had problems with those location pins and holes leading to misalignment of pieces. Kitty Hawk actually doesn't seem to have that problem. But with those sort of tongue groove things, what you have is you essentially have you know, a space like this and a thing like this, and it sits like this. And that'll prevent sort of back and forth movement, but it prevent it has no measures for preventing up and down movement like this. And when you're trying to prevent steps in the fuselage, that's less than useful. So I don't know why on earth they couldn't have gone with uh, pins and holes on the bottom as well. It would have been, you know, easy and maybe made the fuselage a little bit less frustrating to build. The next con is the dorsal spine. So the dorsal spine is split into not two, not three, not even six, but five pieces. Um, just, I guess, to stick it to the left side right siders out there who would prefer to build that up longitudinally, you can't because the center section is more of like a barrel vault kind of thing here. Each one of these sections, by the way, has something stupid wrong with it. So the middle section has, over one of the location tabs, it has a sprue gate kind of just intruding on it. So you have to cut the whole damn tab off. Not a big deal, but still, come on, really? You know, inch and a half to play with here, two inches to play with, and the sprue gate has to go right on top of where a location tab is? <sighs> come on, that's shoddy. The rear has a support brace inside that runs straight across. And so when you try to put it on a curved section, you get this kind of thing where it hits and the piece is coming down and the location tabs, you know, it's like you can catch one side in, but then the whole thing gets out of alignment and kind of bounces off. Easy fix, two snips with a sprue cutter, but still. I mean, the fact that it's there in the first place, it's like, again, shoddy. The forward section of the spine has a lip that intrudes on the cockpit bulkhead and has to be sanded and beaten to submission for it to fit. Um, again, another thing that's fixable, but shoddy. The last con I'm gonna talk about is the fuselage, which has infamously been divided up into six pieces. Now, there's been a lot of conversation online about why that is exactly the case. And the general consensus out there seems to be versioning because you have a bunch of different variants of the SU-17 and its export, the SU-22. So you have, you know, different front fuselages because you have the single seat version and you have the trainer, which has, you know, obviously a second seat, second canopy, all that requires a different fuselage. You also have the rear fuselage, which ran different engines in some of the SU-22s and so therefore had a different shape. I... To me, okay, I still don't understand why that necessitates six pieces. I mean, I, I can get, okay, you've got, you know, this whole fuselage here, 
could just be swapped out for an SU-17 UM, which has the twin seat. And you have the separate rear for the different engines for the different variants. I don't see why you couldn't have done this as a four-piece. And honestly, with inserts into the injection molds, I don't see why you couldn't design this thing sort of in a modular fashion as it is here. And then when it comes time to do the molds, just line the inserts up in a way that they create a single piece. So then you have, you know, two fusel, you know, two fuselage parts instead of six. But just, you know, assuming for the set for a moment that something beyond sheer laziness and cost cutting is behind the reason for doing it this way instead of doing something a bit more build friendly. If you're going to split it into six pieces, make accommodations for those pieces to fit. I mean, even the front and mid sections, like there's a lip in here that makes it not completely awful. You know, especially when you consider the dorsal spines hiding a lot, the wings hide a lot. You know, it's not as bad as it seems at first. And the alignment here, even because it has that little lip, isn't too bad. Even though it still falls over like some circle hatches and stuff that are just obliterated. But back here, it's a butt joint. It's a fucking butt joint with no location assistance of any kind. And even better than that, the rear and the mid sections coming off the sprue have different curvatures. And so if you line them up, you know, put them on the desk and set them next to each other and push them together, the rear section is shallower and taller than the midsection. And you basically have to squeeze the top and bottom, bulge it out to fit. And that's saying that if they had had some sort of, you know, collar to link the two, just a, you know, little piece of plastic you could shove in there to make them fit, that would have fixed everything. Or, you know, a couple of, <laughs> can't believe I'm gonna say this, those stupid tongue and groove things they have, they had a couple of those sort of around the edges to line things up and force things to fit. Again, it would have fixed 99% of the problems with that area, but they didn't do anything at all. So, I mean, basically there are tons of really simple ways to make this kit less awful, and Kitty Hawk chose to take none of them. And, I'm not exactly sure what that indicates. You know, I mean, you can see the effects of it, but you can't get to what the intent was. Is this a symptom of just laziness? Is it a symptom of incompetence? Is it a symptom of, you know, disregard and disrespect for their customer? I don't know which one it is, but it's something in there because if you're going to split this thing up into six pieces and know that you're going to be introducing fit problems because of that, take steps to address those fit problems, you know, own your decision and make something better out of it. And instead it feels like this is something that is just passed on to the builder. Like here, this is your problem. Now we're bestowing this kit on you. You fix it with your modeling skills. And to me for an $80 kit, that's fucking bullshit. Now, before closing out this builder view, I have to uh, take issue with the old saying that you get more flies with honey because this kit and the amount of contention around this build review honestly prove that you get more flies with a steaming pile of garbage. Um, this kit has attracted more argument and more insult slinging and all of that than, you know, either of the two kits that I've done before combined and perhaps even more than the, you know, initial proposal to do these build reviews elicited something about Kitty Hawk really brings it out in people, I guess. Um, but anyway, I'm hoping that the next build review I do will be a bit milder and uh, a bit less contentious, a bit less in that direction, and hopefully a bit more relaxing than slugging through the Kitty Hawk fitter. So thanks for sticking with me for this one. I hope you got something useful out of it, and stay tuned for round four in a couple of months. Talk to you later.